Before I talk about how I made these graphs, I need to address the elephant in the room. My last video got literally dozens of comments, one with almost 2,000 likes complaining that time was on the y-axis. So I at least owe an explanation as to what I was thinking. I decided to do this because time wasn't an independent variable. It was controlled from 0 to 1 for the sake of the challenge. What actually changed with different algorithms, or the dependent variable, was the number of square roots computed. Besides, time complexity charts showed the number of elements on the x-axis, so that's why I did it. But I do understand the frustration. If you're still not convinced with my explanation, then turn your head 90 degrees clockwise and imagine it backwards. Now onto how I made these graphs. I made them with a Python library called matplotlib. In my opinion, this is one of the best Python libraries ever made. Together with NumPy, all these graphs were generated in just 77 lines of code. The first thing to do is load in the data. There's not much to say here, this function just returns a list of x and y values from a file. The x value is the input number, and the y value is the cumulative time to compute all square roots up to the input number. Cumulative because it includes the time to compute all previous square roots. For example, if computing the square root of 1 and 2 both took 5 milliseconds, the x values would be 1 and 2, and the y values would be 5 and 10 milliseconds. This makes it much easier to render the animated plots later on. Afterwards, the entire dataset is loaded as a list of these x and y values by calling the load data function on all files in this tuple. As this is the first of many videos, I hardcoded the file names to look for, but I'm definitely going to flesh this out into a more dynamic system for future videos with the same idea. With the datasets loaded, the next step is all matplotlib magic. This part is just setting up the axes. Since time ranges from 0 to 1, I put the top range as 1.05 to give a little bit of room at the top. The x-axis is ranged from 0 to the largest x value from the dataset, again multiplied by 1.05 for a little bit of breathing room. Next, we define a list of lines, with each line corresponding to an implementation, along with an update function that cumulatively adds data points to these lines. With all of this setup, the animations themselves are created in a single line of Python and saved to the working directory. The file name is hard-coded because, again, this is the first of many videos and I did not make any fancy dynamic systems. I just changed the file name for each animation. So yeah, that's how those plots were made. But Faisal, what are these magical data files that Python reads from? Did you type them up by hand? Although that is indeed something I would do, and I admire your intuition, I really did generate these files computationally. The naive approach would be to set up a basic timer using time.h that keeps a loop running until the timer is up. Inside the timer, a square root function is called, with the result and cumulative time written to some file. Can you spot why I called this the naive approach? To see why this is inefficient, let's run this timer on our very first function from the square root video. It turns out that the same algorithm, which got 193,000 square roots computed in the original video, computed only 138,000 now. This is because whenever we call fprintf, we are flushing the buffer every time we write to our file. Most of our compute time isn't even on computing the square root, it's on this fprintf statement. The solution, at least the one I cooked up back when I was making the video, was to sample a few data points. So if we expect our algorithm to compute about 100,000 square roots, then we only need to use fprintf every thousand iterations. That means instead of using the expensive fprintf statement for all 100,000 square roots, we only do so for 100 of them. This also addresses the issue of having too many data points. If we run the animation for 10 seconds at 30 frames per second, we literally only need 300 data points. Given how many square roots even our slower implementations are computing, writing all 138,000 data points to a file would be horrible for memory efficiency. The most efficient implementation, the pipelined version from math.h, would have a file size of 50 gigabytes. So sampling is very necessary. But Faisal, if you're just eyeballing how many iterations we need to sample, what happens if you overshoot the 300 data points we need? Going back to our Python script, if our file has over 300 data points, then we resample to get exactly that. Of course, NumPy comes in clutch with a single line that does the heavy lifting for us. Now back to timer.c. You might think the most efficient way to time this is to just measure right before and after the computation, subtract the result, and contribute the difference to some timer. However, this turns out to be slightly slower than the sampling implementation because this getTime function is expensive. Sampling is indeed the best solution, as it amortizes the cost of both the file write and timer. 
Besides, any overhead in timing and or sampling will contribute only constant factors to the runtime, and the way algorithms grow with respect to the input won't change. The final thing to note here is where the implementations are coming from. Each implementation has a different name, and the implementation is changed by just updating which square root function we're using here on this line. Obviously, sqrt comes from math.h, but the other implementations come from, well, implementations.h. And this is where all the square root computing actually happens. Now, if you want to see how many digits of root 2 or pi we can squeeze into one second, then I encourage you to subscribe.